Okay, so here's our beautiful pine board that we're going to cut down on the saw. Um, and then once it's cut down, we're going to do a stain here with this Danish oil one-step finish. So I've never used this one before. I just got it to for this project. And it's supposed to be a one-step finish for staining, sealing, and protecting. Um, all in one. It says easy wipe on. So I'm going to use this tape measure here and stretch it along and mark off where I'm going to cut it. Okay, so I've stretched out the tape measure and locked it in place. This is an eight foot board. I probably could have gotten a shorter board, but I wanted to have some excess so that we could try out the shaper um, on the extra. And when I was looking through the pile of boards, I really liked the character that was in this one. And so it was the winner. So I wanna keep this character that's gonna be part of the feature and then we're gonna go ahead and mark off our board here at six feet. And so when I'm marking, I do these little arrows to help line up. And then we, that tape measure decides it's gonna retract itself. And then I'll line it up here and draw my line across and then take it through my saw. All right, so I just got, well, I, over the summer I got this wonderful Craftsman, Sears Craftsman 10 inch radial saw at a home um, resource store for Habitat for Humanity. And it's been down in our storage. Uh, so now it's actually up in my workshop, which is really cramped for space, but you do what we have to. So I've, this is gonna be my first time using this. There's gonna be a lot of firsts on this wonderful series. And I have to crank up this here in the right direction to bring the table up to the level of the board I need here. So the saw though can do all kinds of great cuts. Uh, it can do angle, it can go, you can rotate it, it can angle from all over. It's pretty, pretty awesome. And I love old stuff, so. Oops. I just have to make sure that I don't uh, grab the wrong handle. It also has this little itty bitty plastic uh, push pin here. That's our safety, so unless it's in here, it won't actually turn on, but it's kind of ironic. So our board, I measured um, here for our, and I put my little arrows and then I drew my line across. So we're gonna try to get on right above that line. And, but first I'm gonna do a cut up higher just to do a practice test here. And I'm knocking down tiles on the wall because we are literally at the edge of our limit here. So we'll turn it on. hold it down on this side actually. So there's clamps that you can clamp onto our our board here that's underneath. This is just a throwaway board. Um, so eventually after it gets too many guts and grooves and stuff in it you can you'll just replace the board.
beautiful cut cord. So it's got some rough patches at the top. We'll just sand this off a little. And then there's a couple of little rough patches here. So I'll just take some 220 grit, a little hand sandpaper, and give it a little rub down on those spots. And then we'll put some stain on. Okay, so now it's time to stain. I went through and I sanded my sanded the board here. We're in our extra bathroom here, which has turned into my painting room, given that it's winter here in northern Idaho. And uh, I have my gloves here, and I thoroughly used up my 220 grit sandpaper here. So the Danish oil says to practice on a piece of wood or out of sight, so I just went ahead and covered this up with the towel here, and we're gonna use that scrap piece that I had taken off. Okay, I've got my mask on, we got the fan running, and we're gonna test this. It says to just pour directly onto the wood, and then to rub on with the cloth. And then I let it soak in. So this is the shaper. In order to use this, it's got to be plugged in. It's got to have Wi-Fi. There's an on-off switch here that is just for the spindle. That comes much later. All you have to do is plug it in. It'll boot up. It'll start going. Um, connect the air hose, the vacuum hose, to the shop vac and make sure that's running whenever you're cutting so that you got less cleanup at the end. Um, the first thing that you have to do is get tape the shaper tape on the same level as the surface that you're going to be cutting. Preferably on the exact same material. The tape and the place where you're cutting cannot move relative to each other while you're working on your job. If either one slips, your cuts will no longer be where you wanted them to be. It has to be able to see, I think about eight total dominoes worth of tape in order to know where it really is. When you've got your tape in and you're ready to get started, you're going to come in here and hit new scan and the red and the green are for the buttons on the handles, red and green buttons. They tell you here what they do. So you're going to push the green button, you're going to keep the shaper flat on the surface that you're scanning and you're going to move it around. This picture here shows you what the camera can actually see, and it highlights the shaper tape dominoes in blue that it finds. So you're going to move around on your workspace, trying to get everywhere that you want to cut to show up on camera at some point. If you come back far enough that it can't see enough shaper tape, then it's going to go red around the edges, and it's going to stop recording. Now it gives you a notice that you need to orient it towards shaper tape. And again, while you're doing this, you're keeping it flat on the surface because it's using the tape to figure out the distance, to figure out where the surface actually is. Now for us, we're just doing a straight piece of board, so I can just go straight back. If you're doing a big board, you're gonna be moving around and it's gonna be stitching together lots of pictures. You want to move kind of slow so that you don't get a lot of breaks where the stitches slide together. And I'm pulling back just to get the cleanest image I can in the area that we want to cut. When you're done, you hit green again. Then it's going to save all those pictures. And now the camera is showing you the pictures it took that are now below the bit. So if I go in and I write on the surface now, 
that's not going to show up here because it doesn't know that that happened until I let it take a new picture. Um, but if I move this over the areas that I already had written and cut on the board, then those will show up as well as the picture had managed to catch. Looks like we got quite a bit of glare off of this board. Now, once you've got your workspace, the next step is you have to put on what you're gonna do. You can use the Create tool to build something right on here where you can throw in text, you can just draw directly on the screen, rectangles, circles, and box joints. It's got a couple simple options there for you. In our case though, we're gonna import. You can do it from USB connection on the side here, or you can use the Shaper Hub with You've logged in on my account. I'm not sure how to give authorization to other people. You pick that up and now it's got your piece. You can zoom in and out over here to see more of your workspace and that won't change the shape of your actual piece. So when you're size. working with a really big object and you want to line it up because of some other features, you can use this. Okay. So I'm going to place this right here, because I'm only planning on cutting that bottom line and I'm trying to avoid the earlier pockets that we made. You can rotate, not entirely sure what Anchor does, I'm pretty sure that drops the item so that you can then slide along, so I'm gonna go ahead and try that out. Oh no, it just moves which part of the object you're holding on to. Um, you can scale, but at that point you are changing your sizes from what your file was, which we don't want to do. Once you've got it where you want it, you hit place. Now you're done in design, unless there's other stuff that you wanted to load in. You can move around and double check that everything is where you wanted it to be. As you come up to features that it can cut, it will highlight on them. And you can copy individual things, but it's going to grab the whole piece that you placed at one time. So even though we're seeing one of those highlighted, that's just because only one oh. is under as a cut job. Okay. But if I hit copy, it's going to copy both of those. Okay. Because we had, you had two in the file. Right. You showed me copying one of them, but it actually copied all of it. Yes. We just didn't see it in the screen. Yeah. Okay. Now, once you're ready to go, you're going to come over to cut. First, you get to set what your depth is going to be. Air cut means it's just going to run up above it. It's not going to actually cut into anything. What's the point of doing an air cut? Test to see if things go where you want to, or shave the material down if there's some irregularities in the surface. I'm not sure. Okay. Um, if we hit engrave, it apparently places it at 0 0.02. So we'll go ahead and go with that since we're looking for small, but we don't want to get too small. Mm -hmm. You can't cut too deep. The deeper you cut, the slower you're gonna have to move because you're gonna have more resistance from the wood. So you have to know the strength of the material you're cutting and the strength of the bit you're using. Okay. With most of the normal woods we're looking at, you should be safe going an eighth of an inch. You might be safe going a quarter of an inch, but we're gonna try to stick down to about eighth of an inch probably. Down here is your actual bit, your router bit on the spindle and you can unlock it to replace with the other bits. We've got two others. One is much thicker than this and the other is not shaped like a standard drill bit. I've got to look up to see if it's meant for doing corners or if it's just meant for fine detail. Can any of this do metal? Or if, if you have a special metal bit? Yes, if you get the right bits you could do aluminum with this. Harder metals, probably not. Um, that is down to how strong the spindle itself is primarily, but as long as it's spinning and you're moving slow enough um, It probably could do even harder metals, but this is a router not a mill um, So you can do math directly in here as you're entering in the height So if you want to divide something by two, you can just put in divide by two um, then you can choose if you're going to cut inside, outside, or on the line, where you're working directly on the line. If you choose pocket, then it's going to fill in all of the void space inside of a shape. And it will keep track of where you have done things. 
Um, guide is it's not actually going to cut it, it's just going to trace along there. Again, not entirely sure what the use cases are for where that would come in handy. Now, offset allows you to move away from a line so that you would be cutting significantly different location. But I would have expected when I said one inch that it moved way off. Maybe because this isn't a closed shape, it's not able to figure out where to offset to. Um, I was pretty sure that offset was how you would go from having a name to cutting out further the around outline, the name. Just like yeah. an Inkscape. Outset type of thing. Right. Um, so you shouldn't be able to say how much you want it to outset by. Yes, which is why this has numeric entry there. Um, but we'd have to play with that with right. a closed shape, which we do have up oh. here. Well, oh, okay. So this one I'm going to change to be on the line, and then I'm going to give it an outset of 0.1 and didn't offset. So, no so idea it, what offset what does. What was the size report? I'd have to look does that it up. need to, so it would have doubled in size? Um, yeah, I don't know what exactly the distance is between those two. Okay. So, I'm gonna have to look up exactly what offset does somewhere. Okay. Here is where you tell it how big of a bit it's using, so that it knows how much wood is being removed mm -hmm. as it runs through. And right now we have an eighth inch bit. Mm. Do we have any smaller? No? No. Well, we've got that weird tipped one. Um, so now, Z-Touch. You want your hands away from the tool when you run it. It gives you the caution there. And then you have to touch the screen to further encourage you not to be holding the handles. And what it's going to do is it's going to bring the bit down to just touch the wood so that it knows exactly how far away it is and how big your bit is. Because some quarter inch bits are this long and some are this long. Okay, I wasn't. Some are like this and some are like this. Okay. And it knows how far away your material is, but it has no idea how deeply you inserted the bit and how wow. far it sticks out. Okay. So now I'm going to hit Z-Touch and it's going to bring it down. And as soon as it gets any resistance, it pulls back. And now it knows how far to the surface. And it doesn't make an indent or anything? Um, it made a little bit of a mark because it's a pretty soft surface on this wood. Okay, so we're going to line up and it's got that little blue dot showing where we're supposed to be starting. You're supposed to start on an end point when you have simple lines. If you have a closed shape, you can just start wherever. Before we can cut, we need this rotating. So now is when we turn on the spindle and the vacuum. That's where it's gonna get loud and recording's probably not gonna be that worthwhile. So once you've got those turned on, if you wanna start cutting, you push the green button and it's gonna bring down the spindle, the bit, as long as you've got your starting point in screen. Then you're gonna start moving, holding both of the handles, keeping everything level. And as you move, if you're keeping that dot on the line, then the machine's not really gonna do anything at all. But if you start to vary off, then that white dot's gonna move up and stay on the line and do a nice perfect cut. If you move the circle completely away, it's gonna raise the bit so that you don't cut anywhere that you don't want to cut according to the file that you've loaded. When you're done cutting, you're going to push the green button to pull it back. Now, with a straight line, it's best to cut across and then again all the way back because right when you push down in there, the bit might not cut everything away from the corner. And so coming back to make sure that the bit gets all the way up against the corner is just useful. Uh, for a really long line, you might not want to do that, and that's okay. Um, at any point, you can push the green button again while you're cutting to go into auto. Sorry, it's red that you push to stop cutting. You mean orange? Orange. So if you're up here doing something like this curve around, you can just start on this end, move straight across, and it's going to be following along on the line below. And then once you've got that whole curve in screen, you can just push and hold the green button and it will automatically follow the line to do around the corner for you. You don't have to 
carefully move through the whole corner yourself. All right, so let's go ahead and turn it on and let it run. Oh, and also right here, you can set your own speed for how fast you're rotating. Um, so if you've got a really tough wood, you might want to go with the lower speed. Okay, well this is pine, so it's soft wood. Yes. Um, okay, so you're going to turn on the vacuum and run the... You want me to do the running? Yep, for the okay, first one. Sure. i got to get my ears on somehow. those words anymore. So that's point 0.2 depth. Wow. Okay, so we're gonna have to sand it then after. So staining after we do this is better instead of staining before. Yep. Okay, well, now we know. All right, so this other bit that is potentially narrower, it's marked as 160, 1 quarter, 316. So I need to look up what on earth this actually is because it's got a definite odd shape. I think that this is the one meant to put 90 degree corners in, um, but I'm not entirely sure. But it's got that fine tip on it. Maybe, can it, maybe it can do So it should be smaller. able to do a smaller. Yeah, because I would like them to be smaller or narrower. Okay, but I have no idea how to enter this bit into here. Maybe this is the engraving bit. So I can try calling this the engraving bit and seeing what result we get. Okay. Are we good to be done recording? Are you yeah. gonna show me how to change the bits? Yeah, we're done recording. I have to remember how to change. So we've switched bits and um, over to the funny shaped one with a point that looks like a pencil tip or sharpened pencil and our testing, I masked, we masked the little test block that I already stained. Um, so now we're going to test this. And that bit's the engrave bit and we found out that offset is an inset for when you're doing fills. So we're going to put our ear gear on. through the masking. <laughs> uh, maybe it did. I think it did. Well, try painting it and we'll find out. Okay. Okay, so I'm putting on the second coat of the, our, the varnish here, or Danish oil. And so 
it's turning into this nice purplish, kind of pinkish color. It's got a good red tone to it, but I've got my rag and it says to just pour it directly on the wood, which is a little more messy than I want, but and then you just rub it on and rub it in and you just keep rubbing it. Give it a nice good coat and we'll do both sides. So here we have our beautiful hand rubbed board and oil. It's definitely changed color. It's got this gorgeous kind of reddish purplish tint going on it. And it made the this brown, the uh, core of the tree here a lot darker. But I rubbed it down with a dry cloth or a dry rag after the second coat to get off all the excess. But when I touched it, it still had a lot more. So now I'm using just a paper towel here. You can see that it's coming off just to give it that final rub before we do some masking. So now we're gonna mask our board with our transfer paper here. And I'm just gonna, the board is a little warped if I need to see. So hopefully when it's attached to the wall, it won't be too bad, but I'm gonna line it up here. And then similar to what I did the other day, I'm gonna, I'm gonna tape that over. And then I'm gonna use this. Give it a good rub down. Get it nice and on there because we actually have some oil. I'm just going to roll it. all of this extra.
Till then. Okay, so I um, we put uh, the shaper tape all the way up the right side because we're not going to be putting grooves in. On this side, we're going to engrave the grooves for the um, growth chart going up on the left hand side and then the numbers will be kind of about here in these areas. And so then we're going to put more shaper tape on. Where are we going to put the more shaper tape? I uh, should do another line like maybe half an inch towards me. Um, yeah. All the way up? Yeah, I think that'd probably be decent. We might be able to get away with just that one strip, but I figure it's safer to be liberal. Okay, about half an inch you said? So then it is going to be putting that over the letters. Eventually, yeah, but not all of them. I mean, not, that's not what I meant to say. Okay, so we're gonna do another strip here. Because this is all new. We are making. Okay. You might be good with just that. Alright, now we're gonna try it. We're gonna scan the board now with our tape to figure out what our area is so the shaper can help recognize it. So I, I hit. My husband is here and he's going to correct me if I do anything wrong. So we're going to hit new scan and then we're going to hit start scan and then I just move around and on the screen here the dominoes that are on the tape are lit up blue if it, it can recognize it and then I'm moving it into the area. Oh awesome. Then it, it highlighted all the other blue. And we're just going to scan the board all the way down. And I'm going to turn it around. And it must know where it is at because of the dots, the dominoes have different dots. Because I flipped it around and it yelled at me on the screen and said, orient or put already scanned dominoes in the image. So I had to back up a little bit. And it had just told me to slow down because I was going too fast. So I think that is you stop done. Finish. Updating workspace. Hooking up the vacuum. We've scanned in our board. Now we're going to come up here and get it placed where we want to start. Yeah, we'll bring so our vacuum with us. It that way when you're at that end. And now we got to import our design. And this one. And now i got to figure out Move the whole shaper to move where you're putting it. Oh. Yeah, let's go the other direction then. Oh, I can rotate it. Hundred and eighty. There we go. we're going to have to... You could change your anchor location.
Yeah, you can zoom in when you're trying to see, am I on the edge? I was looking at placement because I'm trying to get it lined up down there. So that's our giant ruler here. Well, why don't you anchor on the corner? That top corner? Or, no, bottom corner. Since you're pointed this way. And then just back way up. Anchor it back here on this corner? Yeah. You'll need your extension board again, probably. Because then I'm off the board. Yeah. Well, if it's anchoring under the spindle, then you'll be okay. I can't see... the top up there, though. As long as you get the bottom corner good, then once you've placed it, you can go look at the top. That's the bottom. Okay, once you've gotten the top corner placed, then you can go look at the bottom. I'm actually really glad that I drew the bounding box because it helps me frame this side too. Yep. So and I'm you glad. can mark the bounding box as guide to make sure you don't accidentally cut on it. Okay, I think I've got it lined up. Okay, so place, and then you can walk the shaper around, taking a look at everything to see if it's where you want it. Um, here's a question for you. Mm -hmm. Didn't vector my numbers. <laughs> There's no numbers on here. Well, you can add them using the on tool text to design, or we can go vectorize them and re upload. I have no idea. Or what font. we can laser them. <laughs> really? The number doesn't have to be as precise, it's the lines. Yeah. Because the pass through isn't there yet for doing the line precision that we needed. Which is why we're doing it this way. So we could do that. Okay. Yeah. And then I don't have to paint the numbers, just the lines. Because the wood will be burned. So I think it's off a bit. fatter down this way. Oh yeah. So I gotta fix my angle. So we'll come back here. And we gotta change it. So do I click on design?
really stay on the line. Because it will adjust. We're on day two of this growth chart project. We um, were going last night and finally it was just like, okay, then we need to get some sleep. So you can see that the origin, the shaper origin, um, put grooves here in our board at our marking. And then uh, we did the engrave for the numbers on the board. So I'll take, this is a router engrave, so I'll go through and just do a cleanup with some sandpaper on it. And we're going to stain uh, with some black stain that I have the grooves that are in here. Yesterday I tested one of our my scrap edge pieces for the stain that we used for this. And um, we also put in a couple of different groove depths. Um, to check to see what setting we wanted to put the origin shaper or shaper uh, origin on. And then I was like, well, how am I going to color the grooves? So I have this black stain by Minwax. It's water-based that I've used on other boards that really works slick for staining wood. Um, there's a couple different colors, and you just wipe it on and then rinse off your rag and you can add a little bit of water to make it a little bit less or what have you. So I learned a couple of things while doing that. This was masked when I did it. It only has a very thin coat of our um, original stain though on it, our Danish oil that we used. And so the paint did bleed a little bit. So then I went over it with a washcloth and it kind of made the board itself a little bit blacker. So it kind of looks, it has this kind of like dirty look to it now. Um, but our board that we're going to be putting on has two very uh, nice soaked in coats of our oil um, to give it a really nice shine and, and uh, sheen and protection to it. And then we exposed the wood. So I'm hoping that um, because we have the full coating of the oil that it won't bleed as much and um, won't soak in the black around the edges. So that's the reason why I masked the board in the first place. I was following the process of what we do for when we're lasering and thought, well, if I mask it, then once it's uh, grooved in, I'll just go over it and stain it and then peel the masking off and we'll be good. So hopefully that will hold true. Otherwise, I would not recommend putting masking tape on when you're doing CNC because it was a little bit of a pain. Um, you can see if we zoom in closer that it tore up the tape and so it's got these fuzzy edges and so it, it turned out to be a little bit more of a hindrance than I think it might be of a help. And then um, one thing that we have to do here is we'll go through and sand our letters to clean up and the edges of our, our groove got a little torn up too. So we'll get that all cleaned up here with sandpaper. So for our um, stain, I just grabbed a lid from the spray paint out of the trash and we're just gonna use little Q-tips. I have here a nice handy supply of Q-tips. I use them for a lot of things. And shake up your stain and we'll just squirt it right in. Um, in the past, when I do the big boards, I just dollop it on the board and then rub it in. But 
we're, I'm going to try to be a little bit more careful with this project and we'll use our Q-tip to go and spread it into the lines. I'm just cleaning up the edges of our numbers here from our little CNC rudder that we use. This is just a two, little piece of 220 grit sand paper and I'm just using the folded up portion and just going in. I don't know if you can see very well here. I'll try to zoom in. You can see where the bit um, traveled along in the wood and where some of the edges aren't the cleanest. So here it's kind of um, got some fraying along the edge where it tore up the wood. And so we're just kind of cleaning that up. So I have my trusty little brush here and I just go through and brush it all out. Get some of that masking out of the way. Give it a good blow. This is all extremely scientifically based, I'm sure you can tell. Pardon the camera here. I'm hold, trying to hold my cell phone while I'm doing this. And then I'm going to very lightly go in along the groove and just give it a light sanding to clean up along the edge there. my sandpaper here and just go around very gently and clean it up and then we'll take the edge of the sandpaper and just run it around the edge here in fact we'll just go ahead and we don't need this anymore oops I do want that one And I'm trying to be really careful to not go outside of my edge so I don't sand off the stain that's already on the wood on the outside. So I'm just going to keep going through and doing this to all of the numbers. And I already did 6, 5, and 4. And that's really, it's, it's pretty darn fast. It's just taking me longer because I'm trying to take the recording here at the same time. So I went through and I sanded the numbers here and cleaned them up. One actually didn't need a whole lot of touch up, but I did um, 2 and 3 and the rest of them. But, and then as I was doing it and I was starting to prep the lines for their staining and I was cleaning them out with my fingernails and I using my little scrub brush here, I decided that I really didn't like the depth that they were at. Some of them were just really shallow or didn't really cut because um, our board is warped. It's not a completely level piece of board and that's normal because it's natural. So I went back through and redid all the lines. Um, with a little bit deeper engrave with the router and um, when I did that I had to put on new tape in some areas and do a rescan to recognize the bed because it couldn't it didn't know where it was at so that was a cool learning experience and then um, another advantage I wanted to point out of you know I actually don't like having this masking on here because it is shredding the masking and so it, it's not as clean of a line as if it was just doing a router without it but I went through and did them and then I had to come back and actually turn the machine back on because I missed two 
So I was able to just draw directly on the board for the ones that I had missed to re-engrave them. So we're going to actually take this board over into my um, workshop here and out of the bathroom so I don't have to step over it as much. But I wanted to show you all what's happening outside here in northern Idaho. Um, one of the, it was really coming down in giant, giant flakes here a minute ago. So when you don't have a garage and a workshop, you make do with what you have. Now we're in the workshop here and I am going through and painting and realized I don't, I don't really like the, using the Q-tip for this application. It's a lot thicker. And when I had my little lines, it worked great, but with these bigger lines, it's not getting down into the depth of the groove there. So I went and grabbed my trusty container of paintbrushes. When you have a creative, sciencey, crafty family, you develop a collection of all, got all kinds of art supplies. And this one was in it, and it's this nice angled flat brush that is working really well. So I'm just going through here and painting the stain in the grooves. And it is very hard to hold a cell phone and take a video at the same time. So we're trying to work on a solution I have a wise cam. I just need to figure out how to set it up and get it going the way I want it to. So we're just going through and painting each of these grooves with our black stain. And hoping the masking is doing enough of its job and the stain that I put on the wood originally that's on the top coat is doing its job to not have the black doing a lot of bleeding. This is the first time I've ever done this. So I did go through with my trusty cleaner brush and sweep out all the grooves and blow out all the grooves. So I could, you can make this chart with just lining up a ruler or a tape measure putting on your marks and just running over the board with a Sharpie after you stain it, which is the type that I have downstairs um, that we got for our kids years ago. And that's actually what this is modeled after because I had my client reached out and said, hey, can you, you know, can you make this? And she sent me a, a picture of a growth chart and I said well yeah I can oh see how this the masking wasn't actually stuck on this one so our masking wasn't all the way secure to the wood so I ripped the masking off and now I'm going to try to wipe this stain off here We started this project and my husband last night after I was like, well, that's not really how I wanted it to work. And 
the beauty of making and crafting and working with wood and being creative and stuff is you don't have to be perfect, but you can just make it again. Like it's not the end of the world. So we're like, you know what? If it doesn't work for what we're trying to do, then we'll learn how to do it a different way. And this is a really thick piece of wood. So we could just sand it down and start over. Or you get a different piece of wood and use that. So what I'm doing here is trying to kind of sand off the little bit of surface here. Let this black stain is on. I'll give it another wipe here. So I'll probably end up doing that for all of these lines. Learn my lesson. Last night, he, after we were talking through it again, he's like, really? We should do the grooves, do the black in the grooves, and then go through and take a sander to it, and then do the oil stain on top. So if we do this again, which I'm sure I will be, we're going to do it in a different order and try it that way instead. Because I'm going to have to go through and do another oil stain coating onto this one again. There we go. So we've cleaned off our black here. So now we're done with our painting here. And we're going to peel all the masking off and see where we're at. off all of the masking tape and you can see the letters definitely have some edging the lines got some some paint bleed here but I haven't wiped it down yet so I'm gonna go through and wipe it down and then see where we're at here's our sign or our ruler now and you can see that there is definitely some bleed marks um, on the lines and the numbers so I went through and I wiped everything down with a washcloth or a wet rag, and then I went back through and I dried it, and I touched up some of the areas uh, that got missed and didn't really take it very well. And then did a good old fashioned elbow grease scrub on the wood. So now we're going to use our trusted here hand sander, and I'm gonna go through and give it a good uh, sanding across the whole board. Went through and sanded it off. Worked really good for the lines. And uh, there's a couple of grooves. Like this groove didn't actually end up going all the way to the edge like it should have, but that's okay. So we'll go through and dust this off and then give it another good oil down with the coat. And then figure out what to do with the letters here. So the letters not the letters, the numbers, um, didn't work so good. So like the two here, it, I tried sanding it and I took it down to almost the level. There's very, barely a groove left here. It's a lot higher on this side and it took away some of the stain. But you can also see that there's the bleed here into the edges. So I'll probably end up just go ahead and doing, there's the three. And the four really got sanded away because um, the board isn't, like I said, completely level. So the groove over here is a lot deeper than it is over on this side or was on this side. So 
just the five. So I'll probably end up just going, we'll give it a good another top coat and then figure out here what to do with our numbers. Oh, doing the Glowforge part. So I've got my Glowforge Pro uh, opened up here. You don't have to have a Pro to do this, so this can be done on a plus. We're going to be doing the magnet hack today. So we've got these really super strong neodymium magnets that are going to go here on the door. And um, that is going to make the Glowforge think that the door is closed. Um, our, our, our slot here. So the next thing though is my material height is greater than one inch high. So I also have to do the crumb tray removal. A couple things for this. Like you can go about uh, setting it in. So there's the, the math way, which is you have your glow forge off and you move your tube and your camera forward so it's actually on your material and you set your calipers to about 1.48. You can, you should measure the height of your crumb tray. So when you're in your machine, you would have your head um, above your crumb tray and then use the caliper to measure what the height of your crumb tray is all the way up to the bottom of the head of the laser because um, that's basically how your Glowforge is focusing and I'm trying desperately to do this with one hand so please bear with me. Um, there we go. So you want to have this edge here be along the edge of your material when you're measuring your crumb tray. So we're just printing. So I have this set to we're going to take this we're going to set it to 1.48, which is what I use now for all of mine. And I um, actually went to Montana for the summer and forgot to take the crumb tray when we packed up the machines. So I had to have it shipped to me from my husband. So that was a pretty penny. But in the meantime, I still needed to use the machine. So we searched online and finally just ended up, Jake got a hold of Dan and said, Hey, what's the normal height? And he said it's about 1.48, 1.481. So we've zeroed this out at that location and we're going to take it all the way back down. And now we're going to take our material height here. I have to put the phone down just a minute. So we'll clip that part out hopefully. So now I have my calipers up against the head of the forge and the very bottom part of the metal caliper here is resting. I'm using my finger to just judge. It's uh, level with the, the head. And then the tip of the caliper is down here at the bottom. So now I know what height it is that I'm going to be putting in for my machine. The other way to test for how um, your height is, is to, or to make sure that your Glowforge is in there correctly, or in the right height, is to have your material and whatever you're sticking in underneath it, and then you measure what the height of that is. And so now my height here is at 1.541. That's between 1.5 and 2.0. So I know that my material is in the safe distance for using the set focus tool. So that's actually what we're gonna end up using as the set focus tool. But I just wanted to show you the two different ways to make sure that your material height is the correct height for what your laser is gonna focus at. These are just two uh, ceramic tiles. I have a whole wall of tiles over here on the side that are on hand um, for testing and or using for various things. 
And so we've got our door open, our magnets on, and I've got my board level. It's on this uh, adjustable rack thing that I use for the pass-through slots. Okay, our board is done engraving and we're going to take our very crappy masking off here. I think that one got a little heat warped on it because it didn't stick very well, but here is our engraving. And if we zoom in a little bit to it, we can see that the, it flared, but we've got our trusty cloth here and we're just gonna go through and wipe off the burnt aura look around it. So here we have the uh, engraving all nice and cleaned up. There's still a little bit of the burnt aura look, but I actually, I prefer that look. And so I am fine with having it have that little bit of a, fl a flare that goes around the edges, just not as much as it had been showing. So water wasn't doing the trick, which is what I usually use, even like on Baltic birch and stuff. So we switched over to some isopropyl alcohol and gave it a little rub and that took off most of it. And um, so now we're gonna do a quick poly coat on our board and let that dry. So our beautiful six and a half foot growth ruler here, growth chart, has now got a, a coating of poly on it and we're gonna let that cure for a few days and then we'll come back and touch up the numbers that are on it. But for now, it's a wrap folks. Thanks for following along.